Hello and welcome to From City of Empire to City of Diversity, a visual journey, SAMPAD's latest heritage project, which is launching today. We're working in partnership with Birmingham Archives and the Library of Birmingham and the University of Birmingham, funded by the National Her Heritage Lottery Fund. We're really delighted over the next years to be working with, um, on the collection held by Birmingham Archives of Daesh photographs and negatives um, over the course of two years, we will be preserving and cataloguing some 10,000 images from the collection. We will digitize a small sample and we will have two major exhibitions in 2022, which will coincide with the Commonwealth Games. In addition to that, we'll have a major community outreach program, which will go into schools, community and library settings, and there will be numerous volunteer opportunities. Uh, this Announcement has been delayed due to COVID-19, so we're really excited today to finally launch this project. And I have with me a really exciting panel to talk about the project. I'm Sabra Khan, I'm the Executive Director here at Stampad, and the panel will introduce themselves now. Ian, over to you. So, hi, I'm uh, Ian Grosvenor. I am a Professor at the University of Birmingham. I have a keen interest in the history of the city and also a keen interest in the history of photography, hence the two bits coming together. Jim, are you able to unmute yourself? Hello, um, I'm Jim Ranahan. I'm an archivist, and I'm also interested in the history of photography. Um, I'm currently working um, in Stratford with the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust but I previously worked at the Library of Birmingham, where I was introduced to the Deutsch collection by the late Pete James, um, head of photographs there. Thank you. Mariam. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Mariam. Um, I'm an artist based in Birmingham and I use photography to explore my identity. So I'm a British Pakistani um, and I use my, particularly my family album and um, collections like the Daesh collection to really be inspired and create new um, series of work. So yeah, I'm excited to be here as well. Thank you, Sabra. And now Rita. Hi, I'm Rita McLean. Um, I'm an independent museums and heritage consultant. I'm based in Birmingham, have worked in Birmingham for many years uh, for Birmingham museums. Um, and I'm involved in this project. Um, I'm one of the co-curators of the exhibition. I'm involved in a voluntary capacity. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm going to turn first to you, Jim, just to talk about the, um, the Daesh family and the studios. Um, at the core of the project is some 10,000 images that are held in the collection. Uh, you know this collection really well from your time with Birmingham Archives. But can you take us back to the beginning and tell us about when Daesh started his studios in Birmingham and whereabouts they were? Yes, thank you. Um, so when we talk about the Deutsch studio, we're talking about a family business, father and son. Ernest Deutsch, the father, um, was born in 1887 and died in 1973. His son, Malcolm, uh, was born in 1921 and died in 1990. Now that time frame um, sets the bounds of their business, um, their life, but also it ties in with the theme of the project. So in 1887, the Prime Minister was the Marquess of Salisbury. In 1990, the Prime Minister, as you all know, will be was Margaret Thatcher. Um, so that's the time frame and that's the social context within which they live their lives and practice their photography. The business of the Deitch studio um, really spans the Edwardian period from 1905 up to the late 20th century, the poll tax riots in 1990. And the, the Deutsch studio operated in two locations. The first was the Palace Studio in Bordsley, and that's um, the address for that was 32 Coventry Road. That was in operation from 1905 until around about 1937. 
Ernest Deitch was an entrepreneur. He opened a second studio in about 1913, and he ran the two studios in parallel for 24 years. Um, that second studio was 354 Mosley Road in Borsal Heath, and that is the studio um, that um, most of the photographs um, that we, we will be looking at this evening and thinking about um, for the scope of this project, that's the studio most closely associated with those photographs. It's worth mentioning, I think, that um, Ernest Deitch in particular was a real entrepreneur. So his business was um, aligned as a suburban uh, photographic studio, but he also tapped into the, um, the celebrity market, if you like. Um, his studio, the Palace Studio, was very close to the Palace Theatre in Bordesley. And he specialised um, in, in the early years in celebrity photographs of the stars of the theatre and music hall. He kept that business running in parallel with his studio business right through until the 1950s. He diversified into theatre and clubland activities as well. And he also produced commercial postcards as well as studio portraits. So I mentioned that just to give a wider context to the Deitch collection. Thank, Thank you. you. And who was visiting the studio? Who was visiting his studios um, in the early days to have their photographs taken? What sort of people would go in there and why, why would they have their photographs taken in that way? Okay, so the catchment area for the Deitch studios um, were the areas um, Bordesley, uh, Bordesley, Sparkbrook, Borsal Heath, and Moseley. Um, in in the in the early years, the um, the Edwardian and interwar years, he uh, and it would be Ernest Deitch at this stage. Um, was building a reputation as a studio photographer. He would be attracting um, a clientele that would want formal photographs to celebrate life events, um, uh, and, and ma major events, but also um, in, in the days before widespread popular photography um, had, had pen penetrated society to a, a great degree, he was providing um, almost, if we can use the expression, snapshot photography, but within a studio setting, that market would really be taken away um, by the post-war influx of cheap cameras for, from overseas. Um, as the demographic profile of the city altered over time, his catchment area geographically remained more or less the same, Bordesley, Sparkbrook, Borsal Heath and Moseley. But the, the um, ethnic origins of the, um, the sitters would alter. So we have, in, in particularly in the post-war period, we have um, representations of members of the African Caribbean community, South Asian communities. And um, interestingly, from my perspective, looking at uh, the, the wider uh, social perspective of Birmingham, um, we have uh, Irish being represented within the collections as well, along with the, the um, I suppose, the more, more established communities within those suburbs um, uh, that, that paid attention to, to the Deitch studio. And some of the images, Jim, are taken outside, aren't they? Or they're taken at churches or in dance halls as well. So would, do you think he would be commissioned to do those? Or is that part of his entrepreneurial spirit to get out there and take photographs in those locations? It's a combination of the two. So he would be commissioned. But we have to remember the, the very fact that he is being commissioned is reflecting his status as a high quality photographer um, and that will be down to his 
technical skills as a photographer and his marketing skills as a business person. Um, so those commissioned activities were were really important. But he was also tapping in, and later on, I think we'll find that his son Malcolm was also involved. He was tapping in to the um, the spontaneous request for photographs at social occasions. So um, at um, uh, dinner dances, for instance, or, or um, um, social gatherings where the roving photographer um, would, would just um, take photographs um, upon request and, and do transactions on the night, as it were. Okay, and, you. and you talked a bit about some of the communities. Can you tell us a bit more about what communities uh, he started to capture in the post-war period? Yes, yes, we, we, we know that um, he, uh, Deitch's um, both father and son in the immediate post-war post period are um, providing a, a photographic service to um, South Asian communities and African Caribbean communities. And that's reflected very strongly in the surviving prints that came into the Library of Birmingham with the Deitch collection. We also know from the, um, the social, uh, the, the social photography, if we can call it that, the, the roving photographer's work, that he was capturing um, Irish members of the Irish community. Mm. And we'll also be finding, I think, when we, we start to look at the negative collection, that he's continuing to work with the established communities. But the key factor that it makes Deitch so visually interesting at this time is that he's caught a moment in, in time where the city's demographic profile is changing very rapidly. And, and of the studio portraits, there's a story that that kind of photographic style is telling us um, in terms of how formal they are or what people are wearing. What, what can you tell us that those photographs might, what we can deduce from those in terms of what people have as props or how they stand in those photographs? Yes, of course. I Again, we have to think both of the technical requirements within a studio setting and also, um, I suppose, um, artistic preference by the photographer um, and possibly requests by the client um, for the style of photograph to be taken. So on screen now is, is a sitter um, in, a, in a formal pose, um, in, in, a, in a pose that is almost official and is, um, it's indicating a, a number of things. There's the requirement to keep still, for the sitter to keep still. Um, so the, um, the sitter is supporting his head um, by, by his hand and elbow being placed on the table. Um, he's indicating that he's in the business situation with the pen and, and the, um, the ink stand. Um, but he's also revealing that he's, he's in a, a, um, a domestic situation as well with the, uh, the, the, the picture in the background. Now, there are a number of things to unpick here, I, I would say. Um, the first is that by the time that this photograph would have been taken in the late 1940s or um, 1950s, the technical requirement for a, a very still pose was less important because the advances in um, technology meant that um, exposure times could be kept um, smaller. So this may be partly a throwback to Ernest's early career where he had to, to almost position sitters in a particularly stable uh, manner. Um, there may also be a, a request from the sitter to be um, presented in a particularly um, um, 
appropriate uh, manner, um, not necessarily casual as you would find with the roving photographic style of, uh, of uh, shots. Thank you. And they'd be having these photographs taken, we think, to be sending home to show a certain kind of life, do you think? Uh, yes, um, there's certainly anecdotal evidence from uh, conversations with sitters that um, not necessarily from the Deitch studio, but from um, similar, similar studios in other parts of the country that served migrant communities, that there was, um, there was um, a, a, a request for photographs that showed the, the subject in a very positive light um, to reassure people back home that the, the, the person was making their way, his or her way um, within um, the, the new society that they found themselves in. Um, and so Jim, it, how did some Birmingham archives end up acquiring this collection? So um, I mentioned uh, the late Pete James um, at the beginning. Uh, Pete James, um, head, head of photographs, devoted uh, much of his career to um, researching the photographic history of Birmingham and utilising um, photographic collections to um, promote civic good. I think that's a, an appropriate way to, to state that. As part of his research, he came across the Deutsch collection. The Deutsch studio um, uh, was closing down um, through, through the illness and, and, and later the death of the owner. Um, on screen now is Pete James and myself on our last day at the Library of Birmingham. Um, we, uh, sorry, Pete, was very keen to save the Deutsch collection. Um, he had worked hard to make contact with the, the, the people that were in possession of the studio and he obtained permission to recover the, um, the collection, the photographic stock and some of the photographic studio items as well and he he recovered them and brought them into what was then Birmingham Central Library um, uh, the, which led on to the Library of Birmingham. So the lovely story that's told by archive staff of him turning up in his van and loading it up with the collection to save it is, is, is a true or an urban myth or? <laughs> uh, um, it, it, it is true, but it draws on an element of urban myth. So it's, it's both, it's true that Pete was a very hands-on um, photographic curator, and he certainly um, worked, worked flat out to bring in, to recover the, the uh, collection from, from the, by then, derelict studio. He did work really hard. He didn't just arrive one day with the van. There, there was a long leading time of months where he was negotiating and um, negotiating both with the, the owners of the collection and with the powers that be in the library service um, to ensure that this collection could be made safe and recovered for for the future use within the city. Okay. And uh, Jim, when the collection landed at the library, you said before that it became used as a bit of an image bank or an image library. So, and we know that some of the re relatives of some of the subjects have asked that photographs not be used. And so we don't have consent to share a lot of photographs. But um, how did the library begin? How did sort of Birmingham City Council end up using it as a sort of an image bank? Um, in essence. Okay, um, that, that um, occurred over time and by accident. So um, there was never a deliberate intention to turn it into an image bank. Um, when it arrived, um, it, it, it arrived 
just as it had been recovered out of the studio, so it was in old cardboard boxes. It was um, attended to so that it was it was um, prepared for storage in an appropriate manner, but no work was uh, undertaken. No capacity existed to allow work to be undertaken to catalogue it or to index it. It, it became um, a resource with a, a collection with potential as a, as a research resource, but it wasn't in any way able to be made widely available. In the early years, Pete James worked with uh, members of the local communities uh, to try and identify uh, um, the subjects of the photographs. Um, he made very useful and very helpful contacts. He also um, advised members of the photographic research community um, in the locality and nationally about the existence of the collection and attracted a lot of attention for that from specialist researchers. And during that phase of its activity, it was, it was treated almost with reverence, so great respect for the fact that these photographs re reflected the lives and li lived experience of citizens of Birmingham um, that were either still alive or would have family. Um, it was only um, after the great um, focus on the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the Windrush generation and the exposure, the really positive and helpful exposure that came with that for the Deutsch collection as a resource, that the knowledge about the collection and its contents entered a wider environment and slowly, not the year or the years immediately after the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of Windrush. But as we entered the 2000s and we reached the mid 2000s, knowledge about the collection had reached a much wider circulation within the um, less specialist research community. So that at, at, at we reached the point where the library was being approached by um, picture editors um, for an image of a black man in the hat, for instance, or an African Caribbean nurse in uniform. And it's at that point that the library belatedly realised that it, it was becoming um, um, a target for picture editors who just wanted stock images. Um, and it's during that period that we um, unfortunately um, encountered um, complaints from from relatives of of the subject of some of the subjects, um, and it wasn't to do with how the library had um, set about using the collection. It was to do with the the way that picture editors were. Um, I suppose you'd say cherry picking images for very narrow, um, non contextual purposes. And the library did recognise that, did respond to the relatives' wishes, and did tighten up very strongly on how the collection would be used. Okay. And, and Jim, you've said that this is an exhibition, this is a, a collection that tells us of a particular point in time, each image is. A very particular point of time, um, but also you've talked about how the real stories um, from these people's lives really lie in the collections that people have at home, and we're hoping that this will encourage people to delve into their own family photographic albums. So, how might people's images at home in their own photographs help us to supplement what we find in these archives to tell the real stories of these communities? That's, th thank you for raising that, Sabra. That's a really important point. Firstly, I've got to say um, that I've got a deep affection for the Deutsch collection because it is so rich um, in, in um, material that can allow us to understand the lived experience of people. 
but it only ever sheds one one um, element on that lived experience, and that's the experience um, of the sitter entering the studio and placing themselves in the hands of a professional photographer. So if we take the um, the element of um, uh, a nurse appearing in, a, in her uniform or um, a bus driver or bus conductor in his or her uh, tunic and, and, and uh, a transport uniform, um, we're seeing it as both the sitter wanting to pre present themselves in an appropriate, respectful um, way. Um, oh, yes, sorry, I, I, I love this photograph. Um, so this, this, this photograph, if, if we take this on screen at the moment, is, a, in my opinion, a beautiful photograph. Um, and it, the personality of the sitter comes through, and that's lovely. But my point is that that's an official photograph. It doesn't reflect how that sitter may or may not have felt about her employment with the city transport department. It doesn't touch on the fact that um, until I think 1954, there was a colour bar in the city transport department that would have prevented this sitter from actually wearing that uniform. Um, be, because she would have been confined to um, non-public duties. Um, it doesn't reflect the whole of, uh, of her other life, her, her complete life, as possibly a, a mother, um, wife, sister, daughter. And it's only the personal photographic collections and collections of papers to support the photographs that exist in people's homes that can give that full fully rounded context to a person okay. thank, thank you for showing that photograph <laughs> thank you very much jim i'm going to turn to ian and rita now who are the co-curators for the exhibitions that will come out of this project um, so firstly the project is called city of empire city of diversity a visual journey and i just want to ask you why this title so I think the, uh, the answer can be found in the very last part of the title, where it talks about a visual journey. And it's a journey of transformation. It's about the transformation of the city. And that transformation begins with empire. So for, to understand Birmingham's history, Birmingham was a city of empire. It was that its manufacturing industry was so powerful, it actually supplied enormous amounts of goods to the empire. And its local impact brought wealth and prosperity to the city. So if you look at the Victorian buildings in the city, the, uh, the, the council house, the town hall, um, the old library before the old library, if you sort of mean, that first library, the reference library. If you think about the museum, that's where the money came from. It came from trade. And that trade was very much linked to the issue of empire. I think also you can say that um, empire had a, a cultural impact because that's the reason why on one level we have now large scale migration in the 20th century into, into, into Birmingham as an area. And part of that is of course, because of as a direct consequence of our colonial history and that relationship with colonies that emerged over the time of empire. So it's a very important part of the title. If you, um, if you were a teacher in Birmingham in the 1980s, many schools in the inner city had um, material produced by the Inner London Education Authority. And they produced these fantastic posters which were on display in classrooms. And one of them had a very interesting backdrop, but the, but the actual title was, we were here because you were there. It was drawing an attention as an anti-racist poster to the relationship between empire and the present as a key thing and so the time of empire was a time when i suppose in some ways you find that um like the anatomies of difference start to emerge about class difference about gender difference but also the the difference about race and race is a product i would argue of, of colonial encounters 
So race becomes an agenda to do with those encounters. And what's so interesting is Birmingham has a fantastic collection of images which are about race, race hierarchies and the belief in a, in a, a, a white civilized superiority. And if you look at the uh, Sir Benjamin Stone's collection, for example, in the in one of the albums is called Ra Racial Types. And you open the album and you'll see images of people from Africa, from the Caribbean and from uh, North, North Africa as well. And often they have captions which kind of reinforce the stereotype and reinforce racial, racial categorizations. You know, things we wouldn't use now as statements. And that's a really important part of the history of this city in terms of its collections. We can also say, I suppose, though, this, about this empire bit, the empire brought people into the city. So um, just to give a few examples to kind of put this in context, bearing in mind that the time frame that Jack, the Jim gave about Queensbridge to um, uh, Queensbridge, no, wherever it was anyway, the Marquis and Thatcher. I mean, when, when, when does empire start? It's quite difficult to kind of pinpoint the exact date. But if, for example, you look at who was coming into the city, we know, for example, from earlier research done at the end of the, at the, end of the 20th century, early, early 21st century, that William Davidson, for example, who was a, a cabinet maker, came to Birmingham from Jamaica, lived in Birmingham, and then was involved in the Cato Street conspiracy and was executed as a plotter. We know that, for example. We know that uh, James Williams came to Birmingham. He was invited by Joseph Sturge. James Williams wrote one of the most important autobiographical accounts of what it was to be a slave and then, a, then a, a, in the Caribbean and a former slave. We know that uh, Indian princes came from Oud in Birmingham in, the 18, in 1857, a, a key date when you have the um, the whole thing about resistance to empire with the, with, with the so-called Indian mutiny or war of uh, independence. And the princes were in Oud. They came to see, uh, from Oud, they came to see Birmingham manufacturing and um, there's a commemorative medal. We know, for example, that Lascar seamen came into London and then went out to sea from Liverpool. And so therefore they came up to Birmingham and they were in, uh, in lodging houses in Litchfield Street and elsewhere. We know about George Adelji. George Adelji became famous in a novel by Julian Barnes called Arthur and George. George Adelji was uh, at Mason College, you know, the, the, the precursor to the University of Birmingham. We know also that uh, he practiced law in the city. So in other words, research has been done about people in the city before mass migration to the city. And it's really important to identify that. And we also know that there is lots of things going on in the city that is about being an empire. And therefore part of the exhibition will be trying to find the more tricky thing, which is the visual representation of all those examples I've just given you, because you know, do they exist anywhere in any visual collection? Um, so the key thing I would say is the empire is a key part of the story. And it's the legacies of empire that are also driving the story. And one bit I would draw attention to, just kind of make the point, this general point, is that when I said there'd been early research in the uh, 20, uh, 21st century, if I hold up this book, you might see that, whether people can see it. Oh. So this is a cover here, right, of Deutsch, the Deutsch collection. On the reverse of the book, there's a picture from the Stone collection. So this was done in 2002, and it's called Making Connections, Birmingham's Black International History which was put together by, by local activists. And what, it's, what makes it quite useful in some ways is in 2022, it'll be, 20 year, it'll be the 20th anniversary of that first piece of research. So in some ways you can say what we're doing in this project is building on community activism, community research that's been going on for decades. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rita, did you want to add anything to that about the title? Do you want to unmute yourself, Rita? Thanks, Sabra. Yes, what I would say about City of Empire to City of Diversity is that I think that you can see the legacy and the impact of um, Empire pretty much everywhere you look in Birmingham um, in terms of diversity of population, the people who live and work here, 
the food we buy in our shops, markets, the diversity of our cafes and restaurants, um, and also in relation to aspects of the cultural life in the city from the sort of Ian touched on it, you know, um, the collections at the Museum and Art Gallery are actually drawn from every continent of the world. Um, there's world cultures material, the metalwork, the ceramics, coins, stamps, medals. It's, you know, a lot of it is kind of drawn from um, what was the empire. Um, I think the first, one of the first items that went into the museum collection, the Sultan Ganj Buddha, is a, an example of that. Um, and also, I, I, I guess the contemporary um, cultural life of, of the city for sort of um, organisations like Sampad um, being here. Uh, I think in terms of visual journey, it's, um, I think that part of the title really brings focus to the Deitch collection itself. Um, and I think the exhibition will really demonstrate how much um, you can learn from images like these. Um, as, as Jim says, it's the, there's a sort of, in, in some ways, there's a sort of one dimensional aspect to it. But I think when you contextualise it, it's a really important part of, of telling um, the history of our city. Okay, thank you. And Ian, you already mentioned the Benjamin Stone collection there, which is held in Birmingham Archive. So there's a number of collections that um, you're going to use to draw uh, to tell this story of the empire and the city of diversity. Can you tell us a bit more about the different collections that are held by Birmingham Archives that we'll be drawing upon? Oh, Ian, you're muted. <laughs> bad habits, bad habits. So, so yeah, it's a really interesting, I mean, it's really interesting. The more you look, the more you find in the city archives, you know. I think, you know, people, we still don't realise what a wonderful asset we have in the city in terms of its collections. And the photographic collections are, are astounding. So I was, I was actually um, ordering to, organising to have a visit to the archives quite soon to see some images, right? And the images that are to do with the Montserrat Lime Company that were to do with Joseph Sturge. You know, there's about six or seven images, you know, and like, they're not that well known. So that's one example of, you know, a link between Joseph Sturge, a key person in Birmingham on the anti-slavery movement, who actually was involved with a, a business in, in the Caribbean, and there are photographs. That's a really nice moment and so forth, discovery. But I think the key thing for us though, is that if you kind of think of the exhibition in four parts. So the one part's about empire, one part has to be about the Deutsch studio and, and Deutsch, the Deutsch family and their, and their kind of like philosophy of photography. At the core of the exhibition is the Deutsch collection itself, as Rita was saying, it is a central part of our history in the 20th and 21st century. So it's such an important part of our history. And then there has to be another bit, it seems to me, which is where the other collections come into play which are picking up what Jim was saying, which is the lived experience, rather than the, the posed experience, the actual raw nature of living in a city. And we are, we have, there are so many collections we can use. And of course, obviously, you're going to look at Bandy Burke's photography. I mean, he is the leading black photographer in the UK. And, and something about, the thing about Bandy's photographs, he captures the ordinary, the ordinary moments in people's lives. And that is so powerful, you know, you can't find the equivalent of that, of that type of uh, image in other collections which are about other parts of the city that, that are, you know, the white population and so forth. He's really brilliant at capturing the dynamics, the feel of a community, the feel of the community under pressure, the feel of a community enjoying life, the feel of a community um, going through rites of passage, which you see obviously in some of the Deutsch photographs. But also, in addition to that, there are the photographs, for example, that George Hallett took, a South African photographer who comes into Hansworth. There's the famous Hansworth self-portrait photographs where people on the street um, took, had, took photographs of themselves in a pose that they wanted, not necessarily the pose that was being organized by the photographer. You've got the fantastic um, um, collection of photographs by Nick Hedges, which is about faith groups in the city. There's also Sangeeta Regrave and Ghazala Sadiq's collection of these images. And we've also got Terry Lowe's photographs, which are about the history of the 
the Chinese community in the city. So it's a wealth of material that needs to come out, but capture the reality. Of what, what was it like to be a settler in Birmingham in the 1950s and 60s and 70s? What was it like to deal with the racism that was commonplace at that time? And what is it like for people now projecting their lives forward? So the exhibition should be drawing on all of those elements to tell diverse stories in diverse ways, but, but essentially through the visual. Thank you. And, and Rita, uh, can I just ask you why you think it's important to share this heritage now? Um, I think it's really such a, a visual and compelling way of telling a key part of the history story, as I've said. Um, for, for many people, I think the Deutsche Collection will be unknown and it really does, does deserve to be better known. Um, there's a real social history value. Um, many of the images that we've heard depict how ordinary people lived their lives, how they enjoyed themselves, the sort of family events um, that um, are, sh are shown in the collection. I think also in the current climate, um, many of the um, images, um, it, it's a, an important way to show why my show migration to Birmingham, why people came to Birmingham and the contributions they make the jobs they did, you know, the, the work in the health service, in, in transport. Um, also, I think many of the children and the grandchildren um, of these people in the images are still going to be living in the city today. And I think it's really important to um, show their history and heritage. Um, I guess also looking ahead to 2020, the project obviously has so much synergy with the Commonwealth Games coming to Birmingham. And indeed, that was quite a major impetus for, um, for developing this project. So I think that that's, uh, you know, it's, it's very important that the exhibition and other project elements are going to be happening in that year. OK, thank you. I'm going to go to Maria Mohid now, who's an artist and photographer um, who uses archives in her work. Um, I'll ask you, I suppose, uh, a similar question, really. How relevant do you think these archives are for younger people? Um, I think they are extremely relevant. Um, you know, as a, as a grandchild of a, of a migrant from Pakistan, um, you know, collections like the Daesh really, um, they resonate with my, my history and my heritage. Um, actually, when I went to see the Daesh collection and at the Birmingham uh, Library, I, when I discovered it, I was really over the moon because I was just never shown or um, presented that kind of history in education. So we were never really taught about, so just so everybody knows, I'm 24 years old. <laughs> um, and uh, growing up in Birmingham, um, I didn't really, um, yeah, I wasn't really taught about migration, mass migration. And so through photography, I kind of discovered these narratives and discovered my own family history. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, like Rita said, it's about finding that kind of um, connection with your own kind of heritage and history. Um, and so, yeah, I, I mean, that's what I took from the Daesh archive. I really wanted to know, you know, all those kind of what, similarly to what Ian um, had said earlier about being, uh, capturing the reality, you know, actually knowing what were these people, what's their story, what's what do these things mean, um, and then also knowing the context behind certain clothing or certain, um, you know, traditions or ceremonies. Um, so I think particularly if we play my slide show, if that's okay, um, you know, I I first off got a photograph of my grandfather, which are, is in my own kind of family album, um, which is next slide. Uh, please yeah um and this kind of photograph of my grandfather really kind of intrigued me about who he was um what you know what was his what was his life like when he mo when he moved to england um and i often found that um you know he uh, he was you know very well integrated learned the language very quickly when he when he moved to england um and yeah so i was i was really curious to dig deeper and find out what my own history and heritage was and you know through the power of photography, I was able to do that. Um, so if we go to the uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a portrait of my parents, um, you know, another, another example from my own family album I wanted to include, um, taken outside the Birmingham Register Office. 
Um, and, you know, for me, looking at these pictures, the millennial, it feels like centuries ago for me, you know, as in I, I can't imagine my parents looking or even dressed like that because, you know, now they're well into their late 50s, early 60s, my dad is in. So um, to imagine that was my parents once and that's how weddings were done once is, a, is just a fascination, you know, for me. Um, so almost like, you know, the, the, the photographs in my album kind of became evidence to all those memories and stories that I've been told as a child about my culture and about my you know my, my history um, so if we go to the next slide um, I think the Daesh collection very similarly you know it really for, for many people it creates a portrait of their families um, and quite similarly my own family album I had a portrait of my own kind of parents and and, and basically their extended family and it really kind of um, shows that time in a in a really um, in a really special way, you know, with the with with the with the way that people are dressed, with the way that you know the, there's like snow on the floor. So, uh, and you know, there's certain memories and things that kind of connect with um, every kind of symbol and sign that's within the photograph. Um, so this was something that I found really interesting in looking at kind of archived images. Um, so if we go to the next uh, slide as well. Um, and particularly for me, I was very intrigued by the kind of women in the photograph and what their identity was like, you know, moving to England. How did they how did they actually integrate or did they integrate? I wanted to know deeper about their story. And I managed to, you know, kind of interview and speak to my mom about her life in Britain. Um, so I was fortunate to kind of really deconstruct and get close to these pictures. Sorry, can we just mute? Sorry, I'm getting a lot of background noise. <laughs> Thank you. And if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, we've got a portrait of my mom here, which again, I found in my album, a family album. Um, in that you, know, moment, you did quite, you did a whole project about, with your mum, didn't you? So is yeah. this the woman from Pakistani diaspora in England? Yeah, that's coming mm -hmm. up. So I've, I've, I'm gonna lead up to that. Um, so yeah, I mean, like just from these photographs, um, you know, I wanted to really understand what narrative did I want to tell from the family portraits and from the family album? What was it that I wanted to explore further and then explain to everyone else? And what stood out to me was my mother's identity in these pictures because um, I'm very close to my mom. You know, she told me a lot about how she the kind of things she had to get used to when she moved here. She grew up in Lahore, um, which is a city in Pakistan, and then moved here when she was about 18 years old. Um, but, you know, knowing my, with my mum, she's not, she still really identifies herself as a Pakistani woman. And that actually, I feel is the case for a lot of Pakistani women uh, of her age. Um, and I wanted to focus on her story. And when I kind of speak to her, and, and just to cut this short, because I know I could go on forever about this, but for her, it was, she could ident she identifies herself as Pakistani before British because she feels she can actually um, she just feels like it's part of her kind of her culture. When she came to England, she didn't feel that her that this was her home, and I think maybe that's to do with her own kind of you know personal experiences of, of racism or of her not actually having the opportunity to learn the language as much as we are supported now with 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 um, uh, in, in migrants coming into the country. So there was loads of layers to this and, and her story really stood out to me. Um, and so I wanted to make her my focal point. I wanted to basically become the migrant woman. I wanted to understand what her life would have been like. And I wanted to go back to all those places that she would have um, gone to as a, um, as a young kind of uh, Asian woman. If we can just go to the next slide, please. Um, so we've got a photograph here of my auntie and. Um, I, I mean, I, I've chosen the various images mainly similar what, to what Rita said earlier. I think it's about showing that that those places and those people and the, the dressing, that, you know, the clothes that they wear and um, the culture that they bring um, when they move to England. Um, so this is the kind of fascination that my own kind of family album um, brings to me. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is a portrait of my mom and her sister. Next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. 
this was actually a portrait taken of my dad um, and then sent to Pakistan. Um, and this was known as his like kind of marriage proposal photo. But he came to England when he was six years old. And this was probably when he was about uh, 16 years old, 18 years old, maybe would taken this photograph. And it was then sent to Pakistan to show it to my mom. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know, maybe that's why he looks so confused. And <laughs> uh, there we go to the next slide, please. And, and obviously, like for me, I'm going into the detail of these kind of pictures because uh, this this is kind of a story that's almost getting lost now. I mean, as a young South Asian girl living in Birmingham, growing up in Britain, the culture has drastically changed and the context of a lot of these things have changed. Um, although we can relate to them because we've heard of these stories growing up and we've heard of all these kind of um, things, there's there's no... The, the, this the times just change so none of this none of this kind of like sending your photo back home and then getting a wife from back home or getting a husband from back home none of that really exists anymore and people have formed their own identities and that's what led me to really explore um this kind of historical narrative i say historical but it's basically my mum's narrative of her being a migrant woman um and then acting out if we go to the next slide please then acting out what um all of this means you know what it meant to actually be um, you know, a young Asian pa Pakistani woman living in the U living in the UK. All these photographs are kind of taken in my parents' bedroom, and often that was living in a joint family. This was often the only private time that they would get to actually, you know, just hang out, take photos, and relax. Um, so I really wanted to reflect this, uh, and I really wanted to tell my mother's story. Um, so I did that in the next. If we go to the next slide, please. I did that through a series of self-portraits which were taken in Birmingham and around the different locations that really um, were significant to my mother. So she got married near the Victoria Square and I wanted to um, particularly take the portrait here. Um, and really just to tell her story, tell women's stories, tell the stories of, of um, you know, the, the underrepresented stories. You know, often we don't know what women went through and what they had to go through. My mother, as soon as she got married, she had to live in a, in a joint family home. So she was surrounded by, you know, four or five families. Um, she was away from her friends and her, her own family. So it was, a, it was a drastic kind of change for her. If we go on to the next slide, please. And we can just run through this. Mother, can, I just, can I just ask you about these portraits that you've created? Did you use, um, what kind of, um, I suppose, did you, are they contemporary technology? Are you taking these, um, what kind of photographic practice? So I, yeah, good question. I, I think for me, I was, I'm, I'm, I want to, I used a variation. I used digital and I used um, analog photography, used medium format particularly. Um, and it was because I really wanted to resonate with it, with that time. And I, I, all the photographs, they all are, my, I'm wearing my mother's clothes, my mother's jewelry. Um, and I really want to, I, I'm more into the performance side of things. So for me, it was like performing who she was, but then also like understanding her as, as an individual, as a, as, a, as a migrant. I think that was something that I, um, really wanted to do and I, I wanted to just completely feel like I'm back in time it sounds crazy but yeah I mean I, it was something that I think I think in a way it really helped me find my sense of belonging um, and really helped me define my heritage as a as a South Asian woman um, you know it really helped me understand exactly all those things um, that define who we are whether that's through clothing whether that's through um, the jewels that we, we that are passed down to us you know, there's so many kind of layers um, to this narrative um, in the sense that it's really kind of, um, it's really showcasing these women as, okay, is, some, is everyone still there? Sorry, like kind of frozen. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, James. And um, yeah, so it's, it's really kind of um, exactly knowing what are those things that you know, define us. Um, and I wanted to really tell that through my own self, through my personal story, because, you know, I, I know myself the best. I know my my mum the best. So I can't really speak for the whole community. But yeah, I did actually want to continue the presentation. There was a last kind of section that I wanted to include. Sorry, thank you. So if we would just move on, the, the kind of last section I wanted to go into was to really show the work that I've been doing to continue that journey in search and really, I think what really 
is the main kind of aim of my work is to look to preserve these kind of um, photographs that really show um, the communities that live in England. Um, so in the in the kind of previous section, I showed kind of my understanding of like looking through my archive and then understanding what all those pictures mean to me, but then also just projecting that through my own kind of series of images. Um, but then also I got the opportunity to go <clears throat> to Pakistan and actually um, explore women's stories there and to actually understand what it means to be a woman living in Pakistan today. So if we go to the next slide, I've particularly taken these photographs to um, really, I, I guess it's a way of me com com um, comparing the two. So trying to understand what it means to be a woman today in Pakistan, but then also what it means today to be a British Pakistani, because often there's a lot of traditional things that have been brought over um, and then that have remained in Britain. Um, so this was kind of my response to that, really understanding and looking at individual um, people there. Next slide, please. Um, So, Mariam, can I just ask you, whilst we're looking at these um, yeah. uh, contemporary collection of yours, um, how, I mean, do you keep all of the photographs that you are taking at the moment or in the last few years? Are you, have you got your own collection? And how do you think you would want your photographs to be archived in the future? That's a very good question, because I think the, the reason why I actually went into this, um, I know I'm very early into my career and you know I, I know there's a lot to develop still, but the reason what really motivated me to actually pick this as a subject was because there was just not enough representation of British Pakistanis uh, and of, of people from India, Pakistan migrate, migrated communities apart from the Daesh collection. Uh, you know, when I saw the Daesh collection, that was three years ago, I was, you know, it was something so beautiful to me. It really touched my heart because there was something in the, those photographs which came from communities that were just like mine, you know, or are mine. So I could resonate with each and every kind of person because it kind of felt like my own family in a way. Um, and so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted, firstly, women's stories to be represented and to be collected. And that's why I particularly want to focus on women and, you know, um, and uh, stories of migrant women. Um, and that's probably how I would want to, what angle I want to go, like the angle I want to take my work. I want it to be preserved and for it to be collected within museums, galleries, libraries and things like that. Because when I went to search for that, I didn't find that. Um, and, you know, as a young person, um, I know that I'm not in the generation that is lost for identity. I don't know, um, you know, I don't have the, I don't have an identity crisis. I've embraced both identities. I embrace that I'm British. I embrace that I'm Pakistani. Um, but it took me, it, it took me a lot of work to actually find my own history, basically. And I did that through photographs, if that makes sense. Yeah. And do you think, um, I mean, would you want your photographs ever to be held in a city archive? Do you think in future? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's so important. It gives a voice to people. Um, I use social media to show a lot of my work and um, and share and connect my work because I don't think photography is just to be put in cupboards and just to be kept in a box. I think, uh, you know, pe the, there's so many stories within these photos. I'm a storyteller. When I use photographs, I, use, I, I tell stories. Um, so definitely, I think it should be within collections and um, and yeah, so I was, I had a point, but it's just, it's gone out of my head. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mariam. I think um, yeah. because of time, I'm just going to jump to talking about how people yeah. get involved in our project in uh, between now and the exhibitions in 2022. Um, over the next sort of 18 months or so, we will be doing various call outs for volunteers to get involved, to help us to get involved in preserving the collection, but also to be Deitch detectives really, to take some of the images and see what they can find out about the subjects within them, see what they can find out about the studios, um, and also to learn archiving and cataloguing skills as well. There's a lot of opportunity within the project to develop new skills for people if they're interested in that. Young people can get involved through various half-term and summer schools over the next 18 months. We will be announcing those and sign up to our mailing list for any um, information that will be coming out, but also keep an eye on our social media um, pages as well.
uh, we are going to share some photographs here of people that we don't know anything about and if anybody out there does know them or recognizes them or thinks they might know somebody in the photographs please do get in touch we'd love to know more about these people also whilst i'm here i just also really want to thank our partners uh, at Birmingham Archives, uh, particularly Tom Epps and Corina Rayner, who have been a crucial part of developing this project and are now working with us on it. And also our funders, the National Heritage Lottery Fund, Arts Council England and Birmingham City Council as well. And I'd really like to thank Rita, Mariam, Ian and Jim for joining us today. Um, in a minute, we will have our slide up to um, for people to take information about how to stay in touch with us. But these are the images um, of people that if you recognize them or if you've recognized any of the images that we've shown today and you want to get in touch with us um, please do we'd love to know more my particular favorite is these two gentlemen there sitting there together thank you very thank much thank you thank you Sabra thank you. thank you so much everyone lovely to meet you thank, thank you, you. <laughs>